Well, good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing? Good? Everyone doing good? Okay, good. So we are, let me get back here. We are in the book of John. Launching Light is our theme for the year because <clears throat> John is the book of light. And so hope our prayer is that as we have gone through the year, we have given you um, the encouragement and the empowerment to spread God's light into the world. So today we are on John 8, 31 through 36, set free, living a life in freedom. So here's the question of the day. What is holding you back from living in freedom? You don't have to answer me, but thank you for answering me. Beer was one. Um, I know what is holding me back from living in true free, freedom. And so hopefully by the end of this, we'll figure it out what's holding you back as well. But I want you to keep that question in the back of your mind as we go through this um, sermon. So let's start off with verse 31. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, now if you remember last week, the last um, sentence um, in scripture that House preached on last week, it said that many of the Jews around Jesus that heard his teaching believed. So we believe it's the ones that believed that he's talking about believing, right? Does that make sense, With all the believing? So Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. <clears throat> but we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will, we will be, you will be set free? Okay. They've never been slaves to anyone. How quickly we forget. They had, their ancestors had been enslaved in Egypt for how many years? 400 plus years. How many times were they exiled from their land? Their kings taken, some of them killed, their people just scattered throughout. There was the Babylonians that did this, the Persians that did this. Romans did this. They are living in Rome right now. And guess what? Rome had their thumb on them. They weren't truly free there either. But they think they're, well, we've got food. We've got, you know, housing. We've got water. We're good, right? But, and they were also, if you remember, the Israelites were slave to the law. So they, they just didn't know what they were talking about. So let's go on. Verse 34. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. See, the Israelites, the Jews, were thinking that it was a physical bondage that Jesus was talking about. And it wasn't. It was a spiritual bondage. It was bondage to sin. And that is the worst kind. That is one of the worst kinds of slavery we have today is that bondage to sin. When we make something that is greater than God our idol or make something in our life our idol that we think is greater than God, that's what puts us into sin to it, into bondage to it. I didn't get enough sleep. I'm just saying. So it is not, he's not talking about a physical bondage, but a spiritual bondage. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The God of this age, think about all the things that people idolize now. Think about it. Politicians, right? Who's going to be president? Who's not going to be president? Blah, blah, blah. Um, the stars, athletes, star athletes, the actors, actresses, um, money, all my stuff. Anything that can be there is your focus. And the world tries to blind us into thinking that that stuff is important and that that's the truth that we need to live by. And it's not. Real truth is about Christ, right? 
Amen. Okay, so what is spiritual bondage? In a nutshell, it's a state where your spirit feels trapped or limited by negative beliefs, past traumas, or unhealthy promises or practices. Does that make sense? State where your spirit feels trapped. How many times has your spirit felt trapped? I, many times. My negative beliefs or my negative thoughts patterns, those can be bad, can't they? What about past traumas? Or unhealthy practices? Drinking, smoking, drugs, sex, gambling, binge eating. I like to binge eat sometimes, though, don't you? That's an unhealthy practice. So if there is any unforgiveness, anger, shame, or sin, or if you're feeling that you're not good enough or not close to God, you are in spiritual bondage. <clears throat> and if you're feeling of these, then you're not living freedom. You're living in bondage. In Romans 16, or 6, 12, 13, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. If there's any part of us that are in bondage, we can't serve God. We are not living in freedom. So what happens when we are in spiritual bondage? Spiritual bondage can create a barrier that prevents you from experiencing spiritual growth, inner peace, and freedom. How many of you experienced any of experience where there's no inner peace? Everybody has their hands up on that one, I know. Or you feel stunted in your faith life, in your growth, in your faith. You're not living in freedom. So how do I know I'm living in bondage? If you're feeling a sense of stagnation of, of stagnation or lack of progress in your life. Anyone can raise your hand to that? I can. Lacking a sense of purpose or direction and or direction. How about emotional turmoil? Emotional turmoil anger, depression, anxiety, stress, any of those, all of those. <clears throat> Feeling disconnected from God, from others. I mean, I love our community. I have felt so close to this community and so connected. But there have been times where I felt disconnected. And that was on my doing, not anyone else's. Right? but feeling disconnected. And I felt disconnected from God before. Is that God's fault or mine? It was mine. It was mine. Ants. How many of you have, have ants? Yeah, in your house? Mm, I hate ants. Um, ants are automatic negative thoughts. Automatic negative thoughts. I did not think this up. Dr. Daniel Amen did. I love his teachings. Um, he's got some great books out there. He's a psychiatrist, and he works on brain stuff. So automatic negative thoughts. Those are those thoughts where someone says, Linda, you look fantastic. And you go, heck no, I do not look fantastic. I feel horrible today. I feel tired. I feel, and I'm not saying you do, but you do look fantastic. But, or Alan, fantastic guitar playing today. Gee, that was so good. And Alan's thought goes, I screwed up that one part. I can't believe I did that. I suck. I know him well. Or, Kim, I loved your worship leading. <gasps> it was fantastic. And she goes, oh, I sucked. I didn't feel close to God. I, it was horrible. I was off key, and I couldn't get my pedal to work right, and I couldn't flip a page. And Those automatic negative thoughts when people come to you, or if you're just doing something, Oh, I need to do this. Oh, I'm too tired. I can't do it. I'll never get it done. Those type of thoughts, those automatic, those ants that are in your head that are working all the time. Overtime, really. Life is an obstacle or difficult. Now, is, can life be difficult and have obstacles in it? Yes. But this is where you are a victim and everything and everyone else is wrong but you and everything's horrible. 
all the time. I know people like this, and they drive me crazy, and they drain me, and I can't be friends with them. Because everything is horrible, and everything is everybody but mine, if I was that person. Everybody else is doing things wrong. Nobody likes me. Everything is this, this, this. Life is hard. Life is horrible. This happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. Life can be difficult, and life can be an obstacle. But don't be a victim. Don't be a victim of it. Because we are going to have tough times. We are, there's going to be obstacles thrown in our face. But if we become the victim of it, and this is how we think and live all the time, you're in bondage, babe. You're in bondage. Feeling of unworthiness and self-doubt. If I had eight arms, I would raise them all. Because this is one of my big ones. And I'm going to explain a little later how that came about and how I've been healed of it most of the time. Because, you know, things come back. And when, you, when we feel these things, we're giving the devil a foothold. In Ephesians 4, 27, and do not give the devil a foothold. When we're in bondage, we're giving the devil a foothold to do other things. And that's bad. Let me tell you, that's bad. How many think uh, the devil's got a foothold in this world right now? Because we're, we're doing all these things. We're in bondage. And so we don't want to give the devil a foothold. And what did Jesus say? He says, if you won't become my disciples, if you know the truth and you follow my instructions, you will be free. This is from Christine Kane. Believe the word Believe the truth of God's word over the facts of your circumstances. I love that. I love Christine King. <clears throat> I will. Believe the truth of God's word over the facts of your circumstances. Belief in God's word is where we're going to learn the truth. Where we are going to be set free. So, when we're living in freedom, this is what we're going to feel. We're going to have a connection with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that cannot be broken. That cannot be broken. It will be deeper and more meaningful to you when you're living in freedom. Because you will have that deep, deep, heart-to-heart, spirit-to-spirit connection with the Trinity. We are released from, it releases us from our past, our past. How many of you want to be released from some past mistakes? Right? When we know the truth and we've been set free, it releases us from our past. We no longer have to claim it. It's gone. It's in the past. It doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. We will act with grace and love when we're set free. How many of you act with grace and love all the time? I don't. I admit that I don't. If I'm tired. I do not act with grace and love. I can get very cranky. If I get very highly stressed with something, I can get a little cranky and a little sharp. So if I've ever done that to you, I apologize. Just know I was highly stressed or tired or both. But we act with grace and love to everyone. It doesn't matter who it is, what they believe in. Right now, is it kind of hard to act with grace and love with some people? especially over the political stuff? It is. But guess what? If you're truly free, you will act with grace and love. We will have a purpose, and we will know that purpose, and it will be God's plan A in our lives. We will have a purpose in life. God will direct us and guide us to that purpose when we're living in freedom. How many of you want that purpose? I'm waiting, and I'm like, Lord, show me my purpose. And then he goes, get free, and I will. And I went, shoot. I learned when I, when I do this, it's me talking to me. It's God talking to me, and I'm just telling you what he's telling me. Because I'm not perfect. It's the same thing with you, him, you too. It's like God's talking to us and training us and teaching us. So we go, shoot, we're doing these things. I bet other people are too, so we got to tell you. So what's, Lord, I've been praying, Lord, what's my purpose? I mean, I have a purpose, but 
what's your plan A for my life? Is this it? Am I good? Is there more? I think there's more. And I haven't figured that out yet because I'm still, he told me what I was in bondage to and I went, oh, shoot, I need to fix that. <laughs> our consciousness have, our conscience has been cleared, no shame or guilt. Oh, isn't that nice to think? Our conscience is clear. There is no shame or guilt. When we know the truth, it sets us free. There's no shame or guilt in our lives. It, remember, the past is gone, so we can't feel shame or guilt over it. We have peace, a peace that passes understanding. Have you ever been in a circumstance where you should be just anxious and panicked and stressed and ah, and you have that peace that passes all understanding? That's what we want to have all the time. And when we're free, we have that peace. I've had that peace, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I had that peace when my parents were in hospice, dying away, you know, going home to heaven. I had that peace. I had that peace when my older brother passed because I knew where he was going. Didn't mean I wasn't sad, but I had peace knowing that he no longer wanted to be on this earth, that he wanted, he said, I want to go home. We thought it was a physical home. No, it was our Heavenly Father's home. And what peace I had, what joy I had. Stop that. Living in freedom empowers us. We get to play, we get to do this stuff. Jesus promised that we would do more things than he. Everything he did and more. That's what he promised us in the word. So if we know the truth, sets us free. So it empo- and it empowers us to go and do, to be disciples, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to, sp- to spread the light, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to set the captives free. That's what Jesus empowers us to do when we read his word and follow his teachings and know the truth. We have no fear of death. Hallelujah. No fear of death. Death has nothing over us. Because if I were to walk out that door, get hit by a bus, and die, guess what? Oh, I'd be home. I get to be. I had a dream once that I was sitting in God's lap. I didn't see his face or anything. I just saw big legs, arms. And I just curled up in his lap. That's what I want to do. I just want to run and curl up in his lap. Be that held. We have no fear of death when we are set free. And we have joy. No matter what our circumstances are, we have joy. We have joy. It's not the happiness. Many people go, oh, I'm not happy. That's okay. Do you have joy? It's something inside of us that gives us joy. Something inside of us that gives us joy, and that's the Lord. His love and his grace gives us joy when we are set free. Why? Because we have peace. We're not afraid of death. We have that connection with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We don't have to remember our past. Our past is gone. We have no shame. We have no guilt. Our conscience are made joy, pure joy. Practicalities. First, we need to be able to be set free and live in freedom. We need to identify the root cause. What is holding you back? What unforgiveness, what anger, what is holding you back? What past traumas? Remember, I told you there was a past trauma. So this actually happened when I was in the womb and then growing up. My sister is 16 years older than I am. Some of you know this story already. My older brother was 10 years older than me. And then, boom, here I am, this little baby. So my mom got pregnant. My sister's in high school. My brother's in, you know, coming into middle school, junior high. And she's pregnant with me. What do you think people said? Oops, you're an oops. Is that an oops, baby? Oh, that was a mistake, huh? Hmm. Guess what I heard growing up? You're a mistake. Oops. That was a surprise. Oops. 
When somebody says, oops, what's that mean? I made a mistake. I did something wrong. Oops. You're a mistake. I had no clue how that affected me through my growing up years, through my teen years, through my 20s, not having a church family, not knowing God, not knowing Jesus, my Savior. I just thought in the back of my head, it must be a mistake. Why was I born? I have nothing to give. And so it was, I was trying to think when it was, we were having, this is when, before our church was ever planted, over at Grace, um, Joe Johnson put on these magnificent prayer conferences, and this was one of many that I was at, and I was in a particularly um, down place, and I was, I remember sitting in the pew, and they were talking, and they were going to have people come up for prayer kind of asking the same thing, like, what's holding you back? And so I was praying, and God, and see, I didn't remember all this. I knew people said it, but I didn't realize how badly it was affecting me. And so this was probably 15 years ago, probably. Yeah, probably maybe 18 years ago. It goes fast. Well, you've been here how many years? 22? So about 20, 18 to 20 years ago. Um, And so, sitting there, and God said, I know you think you're a mistake, but you're not. What's holding you back is that you think you're a mistake, but you're not. Well, crying, crying. And so I waited till Joe Johnson was free, and I ran up to him, and I'm kneeling at the altar, and he said, what can I pray for you for? And I said, I'm a mistake. What? What? And so I told him my story. And so he goes, you do realize you're not, right? And I'm like, I've been told this my entire life in the womb. I've heard this over and over my entire life. And I said, I didn't, I had no clue that it was affecting me. And so he prayed over me. And we, and if you know Joe, he cries very easily. So we're both sobbing at the altar. Um, and so he prayed over me and prayed over me and prayed over me. We um, cast away negative thoughts, and that broke the curse of that, those words spoken over me because people saying to my mom that I must have been a mistake or an oops baby was a curse over me. Those words were cursing me. And so we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. And I walked back, and I was a rock, but I felt a million times lighter. I felt like a thousand pounds had lifted off my shoulders because I then knew I was not a mistake. I was God's chosen child. I was his beloved daughter. So we need to identify the the cause. And then we need to address it through prayer and and counsel. I meant to tell you the rest of the story when I got to this, this one, but address it through prayer and counsel, and that's what I did. And because of that... When people now say, and I am going to tell you, my Christian friends, Christian friends that I know, people in churches that I know, when they find out, guess what they'd say to me? Oh, I guess you're a mistake. They still say that to me. But now I have a response because when people said that, I'd kind of go, oh, I guess, and walk away. Because what do you, how do you respond to that? And now I go, nope. I was born exactly when God needed me to be born, the exact right time. And I am a child of God, born at the perfect time, to the perfect parents, to the perfect family. Amen. So that's what I tell you. So if you ever hear anyone say that to you or to me, know that I've already got a response. And if they're Christian, they kind of, and they realize, and they go, you're right. I'm sorry. I've had people apologize. I'm sorry. So have a response ready for people like that too. So we need to address it through prayer and counsel. If you need to go see a Christian counselor, go see a Christian counselor. There is nothing wrong with that, right, Kevin? There is nothing wrong with it. Kevin's a counselor. There is nothing wrong with counseling. It's really good to do that, to be able to talk in a safe place about things. Some people will come and tell me everything, everything, And that's okay, too, because I am a safe space. House is a safe space. Kim is a safe space. 
we're safe spaces to talk to. And we will pray for you. But sometimes we need professional help. And there's no harm in that at all. So through prayer and counsel, we need to address what the root cause is from us being set free. God already told me what the root cause is right now that I need to work on, so, and that wasn't it, what I just told you. We need to know the truth. Know the truth. How do we know the truth? God's word, and only in God's word. We follow Jesus' teaching. He kind of tells us how to live life, how to treat people, right? How to have a good work ethic, right? How to praise, how to pray, how to worship. We need to follow that. Follow his teachings and we will know the truth. So we need to abide in the word. We don't need just to read it. How many, and I, we've all done it. I've done it. Where, you know, I'm like, oh, the daily Bible read. I need to get that off my list. Read it once and then go on my day and go, I didn't really know what that said. So I would go back and read it. If we're not abiding in it, letting it sink and live in our heart, and if we're not living it out, we're not abiding, and we will never be set free. So we need to know the truth, and we need to abide in the word. Self-care. Some people go, well, that's not biblical. Yes, it is. How many times have we talked about Jesus going to a quiet place? to rest, to pray. He was worried about people being hungry. They needed to be fed, so he fed them. This is self-care, people. We need to take our Sabbath. We need to make sure we're rested. I'm learning a whole bunch of stuff about sleep right now. And if you're not getting enough sleep, your brain can't heal. And if your brain can't heal, that means all the toxins and the junk from the air and every place else can't escape your brain. It's when we get into the deep REM sleep that our brain is cleansed. Isn't that kind of cool? I was just learning that. And so we need to self-care. We need to get sleep. I don't know about you. I've already kind of said it. If I don't get enough sleep, I'm cranky. I need to get more sleep. We need to exercise. That's going to get our endorphins, our, the dopamine, the serotonin. When we move our body, when we do stuff, the chemicals in our brain... Start working better. We need to eat properly. I don't eat properly all the time. Come on, it's hard. But we need to make sure we're, one, we need to make sure we're eating. I know people that go, oh, I haven't had anything to eat all day, and it's 9 o'clock at night. That's not healthy. You need to feed your body. You need to stay hydrated. We need to take care of ourselves. Mentally, emotionally, physically, we need to take care of ourselves. For some, it's harder than others. I'm going to tell you, when I was caregiving for both of my parents, or even just my mom at the end, self-care went out the window because I was more worried about my mom. I would get three to four hours of sleep at night if I was lucky. And if I was really lucky, I could take a 15, 20-minute nap in the afternoon while she did, maybe. Eating was better because I had to feed her, so that meant I had to eat too. And I was making meals, and so that was okay. We got out to walk. She loved to walk, so we'd walk up and down the street. We'd walk in the backyard. But I still wasn't taking care of myself. Hal saw me. Kim saw me. I was kind of a wrap. Well, y'all saw me. You just were nice enough not to say, geez, you kind of look like a wrap. Somebody said something about my skin last week, and they said, gosh, you look so fresh and whatever. And I said, because I'm sleeping better and I'm not stressed out all the time. Self-care. We have to take care of ourselves. We need to do a self-assessment every day. I don't do them every day. I need to start doing them every day because it keeps me on track. What is my attitude and emotion been like today? Was I cranky? Was I an emotional mess? Because that's going to tell me I either didn't get enough sleep or I'm stressed about something or something's really weighing on my mind. But what's my attitude? What's my emotion been like today? Where did I notice Christ in my life today? If you didn't notice Christ in your life today, you need to. Where does Christ come into my day? 
Where was Christ denied? Where did I deny Christ? Maybe God put a prompting on your heart and you ignored it. That's denying Christ. So where was Christ denied in your life today? Is anything creeping back in? What things have I thought I let go of have now creeped in? Every once in a while, some negative thoughts, some self-doubt, some worthlessness creeps back into my mind. Why? The devil wants me to feel that. And I have to push it back. I have to say, Lord, this isn't of you. This is of the evil one. I do not claim this. It's gone. And I pray it out. But we have to be aware that things creep back in. And sometimes it's very, very subtle. Very subtle. And so by doing a daily self-assessment, you're less likely to have stuff creep back in to stay. So we need to make sure that nothing's creeping back in. And we need to guard your freedom. We need to guard our freedom. It is a gift that God has given us, that we get to live free from sin, free from the bondage of sin, that we need to guard it with our hearts, with our minds, with our spirit. We need to guard it. Freedom is free as long as it's free, right? And if we start to take that freedom for granted, and we all do it at some point in time, I know I do, that's when we get in trouble. and That's when the sin can start creeping back in. That's when we can let the old stuff cloud our judgment, cloud our mind. And that's when we start... Um, being in bondage again. So we need to guard our freedom. Grace. We need to accept God's grace and we need to give it. And I don't know which one is easier or harder because isn't it hard sometimes to accept God's grace when we've screwed up? How can you, Lord? I've said that, Lord. I don't know how you can forgive me. I already have, he says my grace for you. We need to accept God's grace, but we also need to give it to others. There are a lot of hurting people in this world who are down on church because the church did not offer grace. A lot of hurting people. I followed some of them on social media, and any chance they say something about the church, I am quick to respond with grace. I was just following this, this one girl, and um, she grew up in the church and then left the church because it wasn't a safe spot for her anymore. And she was talking about it, and the outpouring of love that came towards her astonished her because she says, you guys, I had no, it just blew me away at the love and the grace that all of you gave me. That's what we should be doing. Those people that are hurt have been hurt by hurt people who are not living in freedom but are living in bondage. And they cannot show grace, so we have to. We have to be set free so that we can love and give grace to others. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Romans 6, 14. God's grace. How many of you love the song Amazing Grace? One of my favorites. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I, don't, I wanted to know what the dictionary said about a wretch. Because to me, whenever people say wretch, it sounds like a cat bringing up a fur ball or something, <laughs> doesn't it? Rich, rich. I don't know. It's I had to make, it was getting a little deep, so I had to make a joke here. So a wretch is a miserable person, one who is profoundly unhappy or in a great, or having a great misfortune, a despicable or vile person. That is a wretch. When we are living in bondage, we are wretches. But see, and I think when we sing this song, 
House and I think, you and I have talked about this, the word wretch, it always bugged us. And I think the reason it bugged us is because so many people still think they are wretches. When they sing this song, it's just like, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch. I'm a wretch. I am still a wretch. And I need God more than ever because I am still a wretch. No, you're not. We should be singing this because it says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved me. You saved me because before I knew you, I was a wretch, right? I was lost. I was blind, but now I'm free. Amazing grace. Thank you, Lord. We should be singing it, proclaiming it, not going, oh, I'm a wretch. Have you seen people that have done that? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound, I'm a wretch. I saved a wretch like me. Instead of amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved me. I am no longer a wretch. That I am living in freedom. That I am your child. That I am your beloved. And I don't have to worry about it anymore. Because I have been saved. I was blind. The world blinded me. But now I see. I see that the gods of this world have no more hold on me. I'm going to have the team come up. Because of amazing grace, I have been set free. During ministry time, we're going to be doing some stuff to help free us up so that we can live in freedom. But I'll explain that in a little bit. But because of God's amazing grace, because of Jesus' teachings and following him and the truth that we learn from the word, we have been set free. Will you live like it? So many times we think, oh, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. And we still live like bondage. But we're not living like we are free. We need to start discipling others like we are free. We need to start evangelizing others because we are free. And living like we are free. Come on, y'all.